This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. My nearly forgotten memories of misery at sea on celebration were brought back in vivid replay shortly after Sean and I left the harbor at Culebra. The 38-foot yacht was violently pitched and rolled by the 12- to 15-foot breaking waves of the open water, reminding me of why I hadn't wanted to crew on any more yachts. This was sailing at its worst. No white sails silhouetted against blue skies while sipping margaritas in the cockpit. This was the hard reality of sailing most romantic dreamers never consider when they decide to buy a boat. It was pitch black. The wind was howling. Salt spray was flying over the deck and stinging our faces. And rocks and reefs close by in the dark waves would tear the hull apart if we got off course and out of the channel. I began to feel that terrible queasiness that marks the onslaught of seasickness and knew that it was going to be an interminably long night. Fortunately, the sickness went from mild to worse quite quickly, and I went ahead and threw up over the rail, feeling much better afterward. Although it was only fifteen miles from Culebrita to the closest shore on the island of St. Thomas, the overall passage for a deep-draft sailboat was much longer, as we had to leave from the deep harbor at Culebra and sail past the westernmost reaches of St. Thomas to the harbor at Charlotte Amelie. The passage took all night, but we were able to make steady progress with the engine despite the sea conditions. Before dawn, we had a close call with an unlighted freighter that nearly ran us down, but Sean managed to get us out of the way in the nick of time. Near the entrance to the harbor at Charlotte Amelie, dozens of cruise ships were hove to offshore, waiting their turn to get into the busy docks. Small inter-island freighters and private yachts plied the surrounding waters in all directions, requiring us to keep a sharp lookout. City lights sparkled on the slopes of the island mountains, still black in the pre-dawn darkness. By the time we reached the anchorage where Sean had a mooring, day was breaking, and dark clouds that promised imminent rain were rolling in from the east. We headed straight to the fuel docks so he could fill the yacht's tanks before tying up to the mooring. Even at 6 a.m., we had to wait in line behind two other boats before we could approach the pumps. St. Thomas had a different atmosphere than any harbor I'd seen in Puerto Rico. It was much more crowded, and the waterfront buildings were modern and expensive-looking, though many were dirty and damaged by the storm. I was anxious to walk around town and spend some time ashore, but there was no time for that now. Sean was a busy man, and he had just a few hours to get the boat ready for his paying guests. I had to unload my kayak and get my gear out of his way. I decided to do it at the fuel dock, since it was choppy out in the anchorage and would be more difficult there. Loading the kayak and the water from another boat is always difficult, even in calm water. Just as I had all my gear spread out in his dinghy and my hatches wide open, the clouds let loose with a deluge that soaked everything before I could cram it into the storage compartments. I was sleepy and infuriated about being wet. But despite all this, still enthusiastic about being in a new place. After I finished loading up, I tied my kayak to the stern of the yacht and rowed out to the mooring with Sean to help him get it secured. This done, we shook hands and he wished me luck. Then I paddled back to the Yacht Haven Marina, tied up to the crowded dinghy dock, and set off to see some of Charlotte Amelie. Traffic was so heavy on the street behind the marina that I had to wait several minutes for an opportunity to cross. The difference in culture between the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico was immediately apparent, first of all by the fact that people drove on the opposite side of the road. This was the English-speaking Black Caribbean, though it was full of outsiders, both tourists and white mainlanders who had come here to live permanently. Everywhere was evidence of the gap between the rich white minority and the impoverished black majority. Rastafarian graffiti on the walls spoke of the dream of rising up and overcoming the oppressors to take control of all the islands. Somewhere in the middle of the spectrum, between the Rastas and the wealthy business owners and tourists, were the hundreds of full-time yachties, most of them truly boat bums from the States, chasing the dream of the island life, but with no money to do it. They hung out in the waterfront bars, washed up on this outpost of American territory, with hopes of somehow finding the means to continue the lifestyle. Bulletin boards around the harbor carried notices posted by many of them, looking for crew positions if they had no boat, or paying work if they did, so they could keep on sailing. Jobs were scarce, costs of living were astronomical, and prices on everything in the stores were inflated to reflect the tourist economy.